Um, so I'm Tracy. Um, I'm on staff here, and I'm so thankful that I get to be here and talk with you guys today. Um, so this is an interesting Sunday. Um, we've just wrapped up a series on Revelation, <clears throat> and we've just wrapped up Advent. We're still technically in the Christmas season, but Christmas Day itself has passed, and we're headed into a new year and a new series on spiritual warfare. Um, Mark told me I could talk about whatever I wanted today, <laughs> and I really just want to talk about Jesus. Um, specifically, I want to kind of pull as best I can on all the threads we've been weaving lately and ask this question. Now that Jesus is with us and he's born into the world as a human, now that Jesus has arrived in the flesh, how does he reveal his identity and his character to us? What does he do and say to show us who he is and what he's planning to do? Now, I've been a student and a teacher long enough to know, and I've written enough essays to know that I have to cite my sources really well. So I want to acknowledge before I get started that a good portion of what I'm going to share today is paraphrased or adapted from a Bible Project podcast episode um, called What Will Jesus Do With His Power? It's wonderful. I highly recommend it. Um, so full credit goes to Tim Mackey and John Collins for a good portion of what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so like I said, we've just finished the book of Revelation, and we're now familiar with the ways that Jesus and his second coming are revealed um, in that culminating book of the Bible. But today, I want to place us in the context of just after Christmas, meaning right smack dab in the middle of Jesus' first coming. And I want to look at a few moments where Jesus reveals his identity and his character to us, because there really, truly is nothing more beautiful and fascinating than the nature and character of Jesus. Even if we're easily distracted, it's still true. There's nothing more beautiful than Jesus. And it's part of our job as followers of Jesus to always be turning our gaze back to him. So let's dig into Luke's gospel. We'll be in chapter 4 for a little while. Just after Jesus' baptism, which is its own kind of apocalypse or revelation, following his testing in the wilderness. So Jesus has just finished a 40-day fast and won a spiritual battle against Satan. And now Jesus heads to his hometown of Nazareth. And he goes to a synagogue gathering on the Sabbath. And he starts reading out of the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads a portion of a prophetic poem that's connected to a network of prophetic poems about God's servant, the one who's going to be highly exalted and given God's spirit. So beginning in verse 14, this is what it reads. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Now, this is a huge moment, and Jesus is revealing two things, at least in part. He's telling us who he is, the one Isaiah was talking about, and what he's going to do. Bring healing, freedom, good news, God's favor. And he's doing all this by pointing us to the scriptures. And what Jesus says he's here to do as the son of God and the suffering servant of the book of Isaiah, what he's going to do with his power and his authority is to go reach to the people in the lowest status in society and community, 
the poor, the imprisoned, the blind, the oppressed, and he's going to set them free. He's going to heal them and share God's favor with them. Just this bit alone of, revel of revelation should like astonish us, okay? Because it completely flips the world's power structure on its head. Throughout the Bible and like all of human history really, humans have used their power to protect their power. Maybe I'm the only one, but like you give me a little bit of power of control and it is like work to keep myself in line. Not only that, but humans, we consistently struggle to trust God's generosity over and over again. We see others being honored or favored, or we imagine that we're not being honored or favored as we think we should be, and we lose sight of who God says he is, and we make a grab for whatever we think we're not going to get, right? In Eden, it was knowledge and understanding, which God said he had always planned to give us just in his timing. For Cain, it was God's favor to Abel, which God tells him is also available to him too. He just has to resist sin. Over and over, we fail to trust God's character and love and generosity, and we make a grab for the power that we think will keep us protected. And Jesus, though, he's here to show us a whole new way to be human an entirely beautiful way to live as imagers of God, wielding power and authority in the way that God always intended for us to do. So Jesus puts down the Isaiah scroll and gives an eight-word sermon, which I'm sure many of you were probably hoping for today. Um, at least at first, he gets rave reviews. Everyone's like, good stuff, good stuff. I'll come back next week. This guy knows what he's talking about. But then some of them are like, wait a minute, isn't this like Joseph's son? Didn't he grow up here? And very quickly, as Jesus continues to talk and he's speaking to them about how prophets are always rejected in their hometown, this scene turns on a dime and they like take him out and try to throw him off a cliff. I know. <laughs> They're like, good job, let's go. Um, but it says he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I, uh, like, I love Jesus. This is not how I would react if you guys tried to throw me off a cliff, honestly. After the Nazareth scene, what we have is Jesus going out and bringing the healing power and the good news of God's kingdom to the lowest, the rejected, the lost, the poor. He starts doing exactly what he says he's here to do. There is zero gap between who Jesus is and what Jesus does. So he leaves his hometown, and he goes to Capernaum, and he's teaching again, and he encounters a man at synagogue who's demon-possessed. It says that he had the energy of an unclean spiritual being, an impure spiritual being, a being associated with death and the underworld. So there's a deep rabbit hole here. Um, if you want to hear all of it, listen to the podcast episode. But essentially, because evil spirits are associated with death and the underworld, that means they're associated with dead bodies and corpses, which is why we get the word impure here. The purity laws in Leviticus are mostly concerned with things that make you ritually impure. One is touching dead bodies. And then the, the rest of Leviticus is about the ritual cleansing required to make you pure again, which then gives you access to a state of holiness. So Tim Mackey puts it this way. In other words, to be pure or clean is to be in a state where I am able to be in proximity to life, goodness, beauty, and everything God wants for the human family. To be in an impure state means that I've been in proximity to or touched something associated with death. And so in Leviticus, it's just a few things. It's like blood, bodily fluids, dead bodies, mold. These render you for a temporary period ritually impure, which means that you're on the death side. But God has provided a way through the liturgies and the rituals of the temple and priesthood for you to enter a pure state again. So these are spiritual creatures. This, this demon that's possessing this man is a spiritual creature associated with the dead and the underworld, the realm of death. And that's essentially what unclean should kind of signal for us. And, and unclean means cut off from access to life, from God's holiness, and in need of a cleansing process to come back into proximity to God. Now, when Jesus encounters this man who is possessed by an unclean spirit, we're talking about like the uncleanness is turned all the way up. 
Like there's no ritual bringing this guy back into God's presence. And he's probably homeless or a beggar. Here is the embodiment of the person that the poem from Isaiah says the servant of God is here for. Poor, oppressed, captive, and unable to see a way out. And Luke presents this as the first encounter that Jesus has after leaving that synagogue where he read that poem. Now, whatever presence is driving this man, it knows who Jesus is. The demon isn't like, isn't that Joseph's son? That was a nice sermon, but I don't think he grew up. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he says, he cried out at the top of his voice, go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus, with this like amazing authority, says, be quiet. Come out of him. And drives the unclean spirit out of the man. And everyone's amazed, rightfully so, right? Just put yourself in the scene for a minute. Have you ever experienced a moment where you felt something dark and sinister near you? Like maybe you went to one of those Halloween horror mazes? No, I'm the only one who feels like those are really scary? Okay. Anyway, take that feeling and turn it up to 10. Imagine seeing the physical manifestation of that in a human being at your church. Imagine the voice of that evil coming out of a human mouth. Now imagine watching that person who you may probably have known before all of this happened set free before your very eyes. Imagine being able to sense a power and a presence that is the complete opposite of that demon, the presence of life and generous love. And it's so thick in the room that death and destruction has to flee entirely. So before you know it, everyone's talking about the power and the authority of this man, Jesus. And while the whole town's talking, like in the meantime, Jesus goes to his friend Simon's house where his mother-in-law, a woman, she has a fever, so Jesus heals her. And then the sun is setting and anybody who's sick or with diseases gets brought to Jesus and he lays his hands on them and heals them. Now, this is another beautiful moment of revelation that's easy to miss because by touching someone sick, under the covenant law, you would become impure. Under the Levitical law, impurity is what can spread through contact or even proximity. But here's Jesus touching the sick and making them pure, healing them, restoring sight to the blind, bringing freedom to the oppressed, it's like the river's tide is reversed. And Tim Mackey calls it contagious holiness or contagious life. And he says, holiness describes God as the unique one who's the source of life. And so it's as if divine life is what becomes contagious through Jesus. A normal priest would not come and lay their hands on someone sick because that would make them impure. Leviticus lays out the rituals for cleansing, and people need to go through a waiting period, and they have a washing before they can enter a state of, of purity again. But here's wonderful, amazing, beautiful, generous, fearless Jesus just flipping the power structure and doing what everyone thought couldn't be done. I love this because it, it feels like a nod, like a little foretaste to the ultimate salvation and forgiveness that Jesus is bringing once we have Jesus on the scene, we don't have to wait through these rituals anymore. He can simply lay his hands on the sick and the possessed, and contagious holiness permeates the contested ground that is their body and their spirit. And ultimately, we won't even need the atonement rituals anymore, because once we have Jesus on the scene, he can just stretch out his hands as the ultimate sacrifice, and contagious life permeates the contested ground that is our soul. The next sentence after he heals all these people is just like a summary of all these other demons getting cast out. And as they're going, they're shouting, you are the son of God, which like I want to see that so bad someday. Just like demon after demon. Maybe I should be careful what I ask for, but like you're the son of God. But it says Jesus wouldn't allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. 
So even right here, like normally if you're the heir to a throne and you've just come into your power, you go around with heralds announcing it. Did anybody watch the coronation ceremony? Like, you know, but Jesus doesn't want to be revealed in that way. He has other ideas. He's just doing what God has been doing since the beginning of human history. So basically all this just sets the tone for Luke 5 through 8. He heals the man who's paralyzed and forgives his sins. He heals a man with leprosy by touching him. He heals a Roman centurion servant. He goes and associates with a tax collector and invites him into the crew. Jesus is out spreading the good news of God's kingdom. And he's doing it exactly the same way that God has been up to in the storyline of the Hebrew Bible. By reaching for the ones that we least expect and welcoming them into God's presence and love. And the religious leaders are scandalized. They don't get it. But we have a chance to get it. We have a chance to see the awesome beauty of Jesus' relationship to power and authority. He is showing us the nature of God's grace and generosity, modeling for us that there is more than enough of God's favor and goodness and provision and love to go around. He's constantly giving it away, constantly serving and lifting others up, constantly sacrificing his own claim to the seat of honor by associating with and enfolding the lowest into his arms. He says, the spirit of God is upon me, and then he runs out into the streets and embraces the rejected. And the grace and the favor never runs out. His power and his authority never wanes. So this tension keeps building and building until we get to chapter 9. And this is like the last place I really want to spend some time today. So if you have your Bible out, turn with me to Luke chapter 9. We'll start in verse 28. And it says, about eight days after Jesus said this, which this being predicting his own death, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So Jesus takes his three closest friends and goes up onto a mountain to commune with the Father. And while he's praying, like, let's just take a second and slow down here and let like, the beauty and wonder of this moment sink in. Try to let yourself really enter this scene. Imagine you're Peter or John or James, if you want to be a son of thunder. Jesus' face changes, and his clothing becomes white and flashing. Basically, he becomes like lightning, like a source of light. And then there are two human beings talking with him, and you recognize them as Moses and Elijah. I mean, you've read about these guys your whole life. And suddenly here they are, clothed in flashing light and splendor, talking with your rabbi, your closest friend. And what they're talking about is Jesus' departure. It's the Greek word exodus. Exodus. They're talking about the exodus he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. So let's just pause right here because there's a lot happening here. And I didn't catch most of it, honestly, until I listened to the Bible Project. So thank you, Tim Mackey. So the Moses and Elijah thing isn't incidental, okay? It's not like, let's just pick the two most famous guys that everyone will recognize and have them go chat with Jesus. It's actually really key to the way that Jesus is allowing his identity to be revealed here. Moses and Elijah are the only two people to ever ascend Mount Sinai, and both of them encounter the divine presence of God in fire and cloud and have a conversation with God at the top of that same mountain with that same kind of manifestation of power, fire and cloud. So what Luke is doing here, he's portraying this as an apocalypse and a revealing of Jesus' identity, and he puts Jesus in the slot of the divine 
Yahweh fire presence that Moses and Elijah met on Mount Sinai. Like that alone brought tears to my eyes because it's easy to think of God's glory in those Old Testament moments as this ethereal presence, fire and cloud, right? But in this moment, that presence is solidified, identified, and embodied in the person of Jesus. So if we catch what's happening here, Moses and Elijah are two key figures, obviously, in the Hebrew Bible. They also represent two big sections of the, of the Hebrew scriptures. Moses represents the Torah. Elijah represents the prophets. And they're the two figures who encountered the fire cloud flashing glory presence of Yahweh and talked with that presence on the top of a mountain. Jesus also becomes in this scene a gleaming human image of God's glory, which is what the high priest of Israel symbolized and represented. A gleaming, glowing figure dressed in white going into the Holy of Holies. St. Irenaeus of Lyons is quoted as saying, the glory of God is man fully alive. And I can't help but think that he had this moment in mind when he said that. Because here's Jesus, fully man, fully alive, fully holy, the fulfillment of the role of the high priest of Israel, the glory, the embodied glory of God. So Peter, James, and John, they see all this. They see Jesus' royal splendor. They see Moses and Elijah. And Peter comes up with this idea, like, we should make tabernacles. I identify with Peter a lot in this moment because he's like a revelation of Jesus' glory. And, and he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. i got to do something. In all seriousness, though, this kind of feels like a strange moment. But the basic takeaway is this. Where did the fiery cloud of God dwell with the people? In the tabernacle. Right? Peter, in his own limited way, is still like responding to that same divine presence in the person of Jesus. But then it gets even crazier. While Peter's like, let me build something, a cloud comes and overshadows them. And then suddenly they're like swept up into the heavens in the form of this cloud. And they enter the cloud, and then this voice comes from the cloud, and it says, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Now, this whole scene kind of runs parallel to Jesus' baptism, which is another moment of revelation that we didn't really get into today. But this scene is kind of filling out what you should have got from the baptism, uh, but now it's filling it out with even more information. Because at the baptism, Jesus is called my beloved son, which is both a declaration of God's deep, abiding love and affection and favor. And it's also a callback to King David and his heir Solomon and the promise of a future king from the line of David whose reign will never end. All that just in the word beloved, okay? Here on the mountain, he's called the chosen one, the chosen son, I'm sorry, which is another word from the servant poems in the book of Isaiah. So the the parallel structure here means we should be holding both of these revelations in our mind. So I know this is a lot. No wonder Peter wanted to build something at this moment. Anybody need like a hammer and nails? We're doing okay? Okay. So then there's that phrase, listen to him. Now, I, for a long time I was like, well, yeah, God's like, listen to Jesus. He's no, he knows what he's talking about. But this phrase is actually a callback to Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses says, one day, God is going to raise up a prophet like me from among the people. Listen to him. So that, like, it gives me chills, you guys, and it's okay if I'm the only one. But this would have been, like, hugely important to any Jewish person. And it really, it should be hugely important to us, too, in this moment. So let's just stop for a second and, like, take all of this in. In this one moment of revelation, Jesus is identified as the fiery divine presence that Moses and Elijah met on the mountain that then took up residence in the tabernacle. He's being portrayed as the high priest, as the one that the high priest symbolized with the white clothes in the middle of the divine glory. And he's being portrayed as the son of Psalm 2, the king from the line of David, the chosen one from the servant poems in the book of Isaiah, and the prophet like Moses 
who is to come from the Torah. In other words, Jesus is everything we've been waiting for. Everything. For generations. He's everything that they've needed and wanted and prayed for. He's the fulfillment of every prophetic promise. And that is the beautiful hope that we ground our faith in, my friends. Jesus is every single thing we've been promised. And he's here for us. What's the very first thing he does when he comes down off that mountain? He casts a demon out of a boy, a man's only son. He sets a child free. There is no gap between who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Are you waiting on some promise God gave you to come to pass? I am. I'm willing to bet a lot of you guys are too. And guess what? Jesus is the glorious fulfillment of that promise. Do I believe that God told me he's going to heal my daughter and my husband? Yes, I do. Have I seen that promise come to pass? I have not. But when I look at these moments, these revelations, and I see these incredible ways that Jesus' identity is revealed as everything we've been waiting for, I realize that even though I don't understand what that's going to look like in, in all practicality in my life, I'm invited to sit and wonder and behold him and be changed in his light. So back in 2017, I was sitting at the breakfast table and I got this text message from an acquaintance at the church I was working at at the time. And she said, hey, Tracy, I know it's kind of out of nowhere, but I was reading Exodus this morning, as you do. And I read the line in chapter 33 where, where Moses says to Yahweh, please show me your glory. And I just felt like I kept seeing you praying that line. And look, Moses, honestly, is my favorite person in the Bible, aside from Jesus. So this was meaningful for me. I, I, was, I, I actually adopted it. It was like a really beautiful prayer that I, I prayed all the time. And I felt like was answered every day for a long season, for years. I saw God's glory in ordinary, beautiful moments all the time. But difficult circumstances have a way of blinding us to what we already know, and I, I'm no exception to that. Earlier this year, um, my daughter uh, broke her wrist while she was at her dad's house. And look, I know broken bones are normal for kids, but many of you guys know Charlotte has a lot of other complications, and it was just like, it was just a lot. So Aaron and I, you know, I'm, I'm like tempted to be like, oh no, another thing. But we get in the car, we have to drive down to the hospital because they're in Temecula, and we're like in the car, we turn on worship music, we're just like declaring, we're going to walk in, and she's going to be miraculously healed, and Jesus' presence is going to be so thick that the whole ER is going to get healed. <laughs> and we walk into the room, and she's there on the bed with her little broken wrist taped to a wooden spoon, and she just starts weeping. And the rest of the night was this battle with pain and fear and waiting for doctors and praying and comforting her and, and hearing the enemy be like, you know, more x-rays. Oh, she just, she just has so many, you know, just all the things as a mom. The moms in here know. Thanks, Peggy. <laughs> so, and it must have been like 3 or 4 a.m. And she finally, they finally found a pain medication that worked for a little while. And she finally fell asleep. And I just put my head down. And I prayed, God, please. Show me your glory, please. Show me your glory. And nothing. No miraculous healing. Just a lot more scary stuff. Finally a cast, a barfy drive home, pain management for days. And I was disappointed. I mean, pretty disappointed. <laughs> But as I was writing this message and listening to this revelation of Jesus as the fiery glory of God, I started remembering all this, the way I used to pray that and see God's glory and, and how disappointed I was when it didn't happen in a moment when I really needed it. 
And then in the middle of the night this week, I laid in my bed, couldn't sleep, and I prayed. I said, you've shown me your glory, God. I've seen it over and over. And please forgive me that I couldn't see it that night with Charlotte. I wish I could have seen it. I'm sorry I didn't have the faith for it. And I felt like God, kind, compassionate, generous God, said to me, I was there. I answered. My glory wasn't miraculous healing that night. It was the presence of Jesus in you as you comforted Charlotte, in Aaron as he comforted you, in your son as he sat and prayed with faith in the middle of all the fear, as you told her that I was there in the hospital with her. My glory was the presence of Jesus in your family. It didn't feel beautiful, but it was. I wish you could have seen it too. Truly, I don't know if I felt more humbled in a long time. <laughs> and I wanted to share this with you all today because I realized a few things. First, I mean, part of my role here is spiritual formation. Not part of all of my role here is spiritual formation. And I deeply care about who each one of us is coming in the light of the presence of Jesus. And so I, I want to take every single opportunity I get to just point to Jesus and the scriptures and say, isn't he beautiful? Wow, isn't he just amazing? Like, he's the fiery glory of God. He's the deliverer. The prophet like Moses. The king like David. The suffering servant. The only son of God. But even more than that, I mean, our mission statement here is be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. And we're going to have a lot of opportunities to live into that in 2024. The prayer room is going to be opening in February. Dan and the Lepes will continue to take teams out to serve the homeless in our city. You'll have chances to be generous and to be in community and to pray, and to learn, but man, um, I, man, I just want all of our formation to be rooted in a true, profound wonder and awe whenever we catch a glimpse of Jesus. What if we could go into the prayer room like Peter, James, and John going up a mountain with Jesus and come out with faces shining like Moses because we've been in God's presence? And what if we could carry that light into the darkest places and moments and take territory for God's kingdom? What if every time each one of us opened our Bibles this year, we prayed, please show me your glory. And we didn't stop reading until we saw Jesus on every page. And yes, there will be times when we miss the mark. And we're like, let's build tabernacles when we should just listen and worship and behold. But let's not miss the opportunity to behold and to build tabernacles. Let's not miss the deep truth of these moments in scripture, in life, in church, in our city, in, our, in others, in ourselves, where Jesus shows us who he is and where he shows us what he came to do, what he empowers us to do. So here's where I want to land the plane, and I'm going to ask Aaron and the team to come up while I wrap this up. I want to go to Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, and he's praying first and foremost for his circle of followers, which includes us. And then he starts praying for all of these people who will get brought into the family of God through them telling the story about him. He prays this prayer and he says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. He says, O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, your character, 
and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus is a prayer poet, and I love it. Like he's praying for me and you guys that we would see and experience his glory and his love, that we would experience him living in us. This means that you are a human being fully alive. You are equipped and empowered, and I hope emboldened, to face any darkness with the assurance that there is a light in you that will never be extinguished. Jesus is alive in you. His glory is in you. You get to carry it out to the poor, the oppressed, the blind, to a city where people can't see past their anxiety or their illness, their lack or their loss. You get to carry the presence of God, of Jesus, inside of you into that darkness. You get to carry that power and authority and give it away. Knowing that the well of Jesus' generous love will never run out. So my deepest hope today was that everyone in this room would get to experience Jesus' beauty and presence So as we go into a time of response and worship, there will be a team of trusted people up here on either side of the stage ready to pray for you. If you just want to see God's glory, if you need a revelation of the character and love of Jesus, if you want to be commissioned to do what he did, or if there's a place in your life that feels dark or painful, and you just wanna invite God in. They're here, or they will be in a second, and they would love to pray for you. Come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus, come Father, please show us your glory.